Hi, my name is Noel Bell, and today I'm chatting with Dr. John Rowan, much respected elder of Britain's psychotherapy scene, and one of our most incisive writers on the transpersonal. In this interview, John discusses the whole notion of integrative psychotherapy practice. Well known in the psychotherapy environment for his work on subpersonalities, his other books are Ordinary Ecstasy, Healing the Male Psyche, Therapy as Initiation, and more recently, Personification, Using the Dialogical Self in Psychotherapy and Counselling. I undertook the interview at John's house in Chingford in North East London. So John, thanks for agreeing to have the chat. Mm. I'm really impressed by the number of cushions <laughs> in, in this room. Yeah. Um, and uh, is this one of your therapeutic rooms that you use? It is the therapeutic room. The therapy room. Yeah. An ex-Marxist mm. living in Norman Tebbit territory of Chingford. Mm. How do you explain that one? <laughs> Uh, that's what you do, I mean. But you're originally from the London area? I'm not originally from anywhere, really. In my first 30 years, I lived in 30 different places. Wow. Hard to pin down. <laughs> I heard Spike Milligan once say that groveling will get you nowhere, but yeah. you are known as the father of humanism. <laughs> at least in the UK but what I'd like to kind of focus on is where you see an intricative psychotherapeutic practice yeah yeah so can we just talk a little about what analysis has offered us in terms of tools and techniques maybe its limitations and then the thrust of humanism psychoanalysis has, itself has quite a long history the idea of the unconscious goes back into the 17th century, in fact. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, called uh, The Unconscious, um, which has the whole history of all that. So Freud didn't invent the unconscious, but uh, what he did was to uh, explore it, um, particularly through dreams. And uh, his book on dreams is actually still worth reading. It's uh, an extraordinarily honest book about his own dreams and uh, this kind of thing so uh, he's not trying to kind of hide behind a theory he's really uh, exploring his own uh, consciousness and, and uh, where it works and and, uh, and he contributed an awful lot um, they once did a survey of uh, heads of psychology departments in American universities uh, uh, it was a question, who was the greatest psychologist who ever lived? And uh, uh, Freud came out top of, of the list. Curious paradox is, those same heads of departments do not teach Freud. He's regarded as unscientific, and mm -hmm. therefore uh, is excluded from the actual teaching. So th there's all kinds of paradoxes about, about, about Freud. And also, it's always very annoying to me, the way in which um, psychoanalysts claim that Freud is behind every form of therapy known to man. Um, and, uh, you know, you only have to mention names like uh, Carl Rogers and uh, uh, Moreno uh, and uh, uh, Alvin Mara, great humanistic uh, psychologist. Um, don't depend on Freud a bit, uh, not at all. Uh, and so, uh, psychoanalysts are annoying to everybody other than psychoanalysts uh, <laughs> because they claim to be the proper therapist. Everything else derives from them and depends on them. And But they have the pure doctrine, uh, unchanged and unspoiled uh, from Freud, you see. And, and in their institutes, uh, they want to have as their supervisors and teachers people who shook the hand of Freud, mm -hmm. or who shook the hand, somebody who shook the hand of Freud, or somebody who, you know, shook the hand or shook the hand or shook the hand of Freud. Um, and so there's a d depressing kind of orthodoxy uh, attaching to uh, psychoanalysts. But... Uh, you know, uh, there are some great psychoanalysts uh, who are 
uh, free of this taint. Uh, uh, people like Bion and um, uh, uh, Winnicott, um, uh, who are, um, you know, exempt, I think, from some of these uh, criticisms. Yeah, sure. Um, where where would you see in your own world view if, where people like maybe Adler with his idea of birth order came in? What relevance? It's all, it's all good stuff. I mean, Adler's uh, one of the people who influenced Carl Rogers, actually. Mm. Um, and uh, his idea of, sort of social interest is uh, very relevant uh, to any therapy that wants to be uh, uh, relevant to the uh, social uh, movements of the day and so forth. Uh, and of course, uh, the latest uh, uh, extension of that is uh, Ken Wilber's AQAL, um, which says that uh, all quadrants, all levels, which um, which says that always in therapy you should be paying attention to four quadrants: mm -hmm. um, uh, the internal consciousness, the uh, uh, the we, the um, social milieu, the social background of of the person, uh, the, 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 and then the fourth. Bottom right quadrant is, is the uh, the great social um, background, all that uh, economics, sociology, this kind of stuff, and then the uh, the other quadrant is the uh, the physiological uh, facts, uh, factual stuff about physiology and uh, neurophysiology and so forth. A lot of interest in that today. And uh, I think that's right, that um, uh, any proper form of dealing with uh, the whole human being has to deal with those four quadrants. I've been reading uh, Brand Courtright recently. His, yeah, he's good. He makes the point that it's, it's bizarre that psychology, which claimed to provide a narrative of human existence, mm. for so long had failed to take account of the spirit realm. Oh, yeah. Why? Well, because um, in the 19th century, uh, psychology established itself as a science. And um, that has an upside and a downside. The, the upside is that, like any science, it can actually grow, it can develop, it can be proper foundations and, you know, uh, why you're saying what you're saying and it's how it's based experimentally. Um, huge uh, step forward in a way. Snag is that the model of science that they adopted was a daft model of science, a much too narrow, uh, generally called positivism, uh, positivist notion of science, um, which says that everything is either true or false, it's black or white, it's uh, right or wrong. Um, and this uh, logic, which uh, is, uh, goes back to Aristotle, um, and is also the logic on which computers are founded, Boolean logic, uh, behind uh, computer models. Um, um, this is absolutely fine for things. It works extremely well as long as you're studying things. It doesn't work for people, because people are not black and white. People are not either or. People are not uh, either this or, or that. They're this and that, um, and the other as well. Um, in other words, for dealing with human beings, you need a different kind of logic, and uh, which is hard, uh, to uh, pin down in the same way that you can pin down the positivist mm -hmm. type of logic and so on. And uh, I, I, I call it dialectical logic and uh, Ken Wilber calls it vision logic and uh, there are various other ways of, 
uh, describing it, uh, second-tier thinking mm. is another way of uh, putting it. As a sort of, and that's what we need for human beings. Because, uh, to put it simply, the basic statement of uh, formal logic is uh, A is A. See, that sounds more or less un unchallengeable, doesn't it? Um, but the dialectical logic, the basic statement of the same level, is uh, A is not simply A. Mm -hmm. See, and that's why it's useful for dealing with human beings, because you come into my therapy room, I say, no is no. Well, that doesn't give me much to go on, really. No is no, so... No. But if if the statement is, no is not simply no, that gives us something to work on. It gives us some opening that something might happen, something might... some revelation might appear. So if no is not simply no, what else is it? What, what do we not know about no yet? that we need to know. Yeah. You also wrote extensively on sub-personalities. Yeah, which I have now gone off, by the way. Oh, really? Yes, I, I, I can actually give you the book to take away with you. Okay, um, I hope you'll sign it as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, eye positions, that's the new word, eye positions. This comes from a development called uh, The Dialogical Self. Uh, from a guy called, uh, started with a guy called Hugh, Hubert Hermans in the Netherlands. And uh, there's a big conference coming off in uh, August in uh, The Hague, um, which should be uh, quite quite big, I think, probably about 500, 600 people. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. But the idea of eye positions is more sophisticated than the idea of subpersonalities. Because subpersonalities give you two drawbacks. One is that it lends itself to reification. In other words, if you have a subpersonality, did you have it yesterday? Are you going to have it tomorrow? Uh, what's its history? What's its uh, uh, how important is it? So, uh, and there's an it there. In other words, called a subpersonality. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of an I position is that it's same old I all over the place, but it takes up this position in this situation, it takes up this position in that situation, it takes up a different position in another situation, and so forth. And so an I position doesn't lend itself to reification in the same way. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the other drawback is with sub-personalities, it's always sub-something, so less than the whole person, and so forth. But with an I position, it can also be super, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well as sub. Um, so you can have a conversation with your soul, uh, as uh, Brent Cortright mm. uh, suggested. Uh, or you can talk to God. You know, there's a whole series of books called Conversations with God. You know. um, well, they're not sub anything, so you can't call them sub personalities, mm. but you can call them my position. You're listening to an interview with Dr. John Rowan with me, Noel Bell. I've heard you speak <coughs> in the past about your cushion work, mm. and we're certainly surrounded by quite a few cushions yeah. in this room we're in at the moment. Okay. I've got two questions around this, really. A, can old tools and techniques be called transpersonal if you're in a transpersonal framework? And B, can a materialistic atheist client come and see a transpersonal practitioner well I don't particularly call myself a, a transpersonal practitioner I, I'm an everything practitioner um, I have a lot of strings to my bow all around and uh, the idea of, the beauty of, of the idea of eye positions is they could use it at any level of consciousness. They'd have to be transpersonal at any level of consciousness. So if you say, well, you know, on the one hand, um, uh, I want to go to uh, Paris and uh, spend a lot of time there. On the other hand, uh, I want to spend uh, more time in my study, uh, going deeper into, into things and so forth. Uh, uh, well... 
you could explore that conflict, that mm-hmm. inner conflict, with the use of cushions. Mm-hmm. Like this one, this, this one, that, so on. Um, it's useful for anything, you see. On the other hand, if you say, well, you know, sometimes I wonder if my, my soul understands my um, ego. Um, you could do that with cushions as well. Oh, there's, there's a whole range of things. So it's not restricted to any one level of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could use uh, cushions. Even if you're a psychoanalyst, you know, you could uh, say, well, my conscious mind says this, but my unconscious says that. You know. Okay, well, what's the reply to that? Even in analysis, there are people like, say, Michael Egan, yeah, who yeah. talk about the mysticism. Brilliant, yes, I love Michael Egan. He's a very, very interesting guy. So I guess tools and techniques, to be truly intricative, um, we're really using anything and everything yeah. to meet the needs of the client. Yeah. And my my quarrel with uh, most of what's called integrative approaches is that they they leave out the transpersonal altogether. Mm. Most of the books on integrative psychotherapy have nothing to say about the transpersonal. But equally, a lot of intricates of transpersonal pay lip service to CBT. Well, CBT is a, a honest game. It's uh, nothing uh, hideous about it. So. I agree, but some training courses under the transpersonal umbrella, intricative, will just include one lecture on CBT and I just, I'm often left wondering, is that sufficient? Well, that's a good question. I haven't got the answer, but uh, I think it's a good question. And also, I don't know one single integrative course that covers primal work. Seems to be primal is an extremely important form of therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to call your course integrative and not include that seems to be utterly absurd. They all do it. And so I, I call transpersonal and the primal the terrible twins of uh, psychotherapy because it's ever so easy to leave them out. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to bother with that. Yeah. <laughs> Too much. To yeah. Ask. Yeah. Do you do you make any distinction in tools and techniques that you would use for a client in short term therapy? Say, for instance, you had time restricted for whatever reason, whether you're working perhaps in an organisational setting or even in private practice, where you could only see someone for maybe six to eight sessions. Would that dictate? the kind of tools and techniques you would employ. Oh, absolutely, because uh, if you've got short-term work, you generally have goals, or a goal, or some goals. How many goals you've got time for. Um, um, whereas in long-term work, having goals is a complete non, no-no. Mm. You must not have goals in long-term work. Goals is out. Forget about goals. Because I've heard someone say that in in longer term work, even still, the early sessions are the well of information. What do you think of that? Or do you think the initial sessions are just, you know, the presenting issues can often just be a smokescreen for what the real problem is? Yeah, I'm not very interested in the presenting issues. Mm. I think... Uh, uh, they're a good, uh, they're your ticket for getting in, so to speak. Uh, have to have a presenting issue, otherwise they won't see you. you, know, you know. Mm. But uh, it's all bullshit, really. I mean, what 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 I'm interested in, and I think what most good therapists are interested in, is, is the whole person who's uh, in the room, you know, not the one slice that they've chosen to present. Mm-hmm. You've talked in in the past about um, 
ways of being um, as a therapist, and you've said Clarkson's book mm. is a must-read for all therapists. I think so, yes. But you also said she's pretty poor on transpersonal. Yes, yes. Not everybody's got their strengths and their weaknesses. I think her strength is emphasising that there are five relationships all going on at the same time and uh, uh, to regard it as uh, just one is uh, simply a mistake and uh, a mistake that I think most therapists make um, so uh, the core mistake I've also heard you speak about practicing do you let the therapy unravel or do you have at the back of your mind a an internal map that you refer to or do you just let go as well I let go as well I I mean I have written about a possible map which is uh, the uh, the map used by the alchemists mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Expatiated upon by Jung and a lot of the other Jungians as well, um, because I think the alchemical model alerts you to a lot of the more subtle things that can happen in uh, long-term therapy, and in particular the importance of the negredo, that is the importance of uh, negative episodes in uh, therapy, that. Um, you know, when things go wrong in therapy and the client gets completely upset and uh, thinks of leaving and this kind of thing, uh, that's some of the most valuable stuff. And, and the alchemical model makes it clear that they are just as much uh, a part of the process as the uh, nicer more positive things that can happen and this is part of the dialectical aspect of the whole therapy that uh, if something is good the opposite can also be good Uh, my great teacher Bill Swartley um, used to say that uh, if something isn't working try the exact opposite you're listening to an interview with Dr. John Rowan with me, Noel Bell. Dream work, the alchemical process mm-hmm. can give you a kind of a way into maybe interpreting dreams. Absolutely, although I, I don't like the word interpreting in relation to dreams actually because that puts the uh, therapist in a position of being the expert um, Even I, though the client is paying, yes, I think it's always wrong for the therapist to play the role of expert. Mm. I, I think the therapist is always a co co worker, so to speak, a mm. co explorer, uh, and uh, therapist uh, opens themselves up. It's very relational. You see, the whole of therapy has become more relational in recent years as one of the great trends and uh, very peculiar this uh, book I've just seen on uh, uh, presenting a lot of different forms of therapy and so forth Uh, there's hardly any mention of this uh, extraordinary revolution that's taken place over the past 20 or 30 years in uh, psychotherapy where the emphasis is now all or so much on the uh, relationship. Oh. Even for analysts? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. The analysts started it mm. in 1989 or something, or thereabouts, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there was this group of psychoanalysts who talked about uh, intersubjectivity, that was the term. Intersubjectivity, that uh, therapist is, therapy is not a question, or an analysis is not a question of an analyst analyzing and analyzing. Uh, it's about um, intersubjectivity. 
Um, and that was a, a shocking change. And it was so shocking was the way in which it swept the board without anybody really commenting on it or questioning it or talking about it. Just swept the board. Everybody's very on that. I can't think of a thing for psychotherapy. It doesn't claim to be more relational than everybody else. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable change. That mirrors the increased democratisation. Mm. I mean, eighty nine, you had the fall of the mm. the Berlin Wall and all the rest of it. Because I often think the fifties with Rogers and others that there was this greater democratic thrust in society. Oh, is indeed. that reflecting in the counseling? Well, humanistic psychology is far more democratic than anything that went before. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you'll notice is that at uh, humanistic uh, conferences there's always time for questions at the end of every talk. Um, most other approaches to uh, uh, if it's a, if it's a sixty-minute talk, the guy talks for sixty minutes. Uh, bingo, next, please. You know. Uh, whereas uh, humanistic psychology has this democratic quality to it. It doesn't matter which, whether it's gestalt or whether it's mm. psychodrama or whether it's uh, anything. Mm. There's always room for dispute. Discourage discussion, uh, uh, exploration, and so forth. It's never presented as uh, this is cut and dried and this is what you believe. Forget it about anything else. You know. Courtright mentions the one thing to be dogmatic about mm-hmm. is not to be dogmatic. <laughs> well, there's a danger in that, you see. I think being too dogmatic about that. But Probably well. well, I love what um, I think it was um, Oscar Wilde said: uh, "All generalizations are false, including this one." Yeah, yeah. Your birth year was nineteen twenty-five. Yeah. So, if if I may say, you're probably in your elder years. I could say you could say. Actually, this is a very nice statement, which. Uh, uh, I think it's useful that the 60s is the young old the 70s is the middle old the 80s is the old old and the 90s is the frail old oh right okay I think that's rather good and you're about to enter the <laughs> the 90s yeah I'm at CCPE and one of the courses that uh, was a prerequisite before I went on there to postgraduate diploma was um, a basic skills weekend at the centre. And it's still been one of the most impressing little role plays I did when we used this exercise, who are you? Mm. And you keep repeating, who are you? Yeah. And... I still refer back to that as a point of reference. So if I said to you now, in your elder years, Mm. who are you, what would you say? Well, it's a question of levels. You see, um, Wilbur is the clearest writer on this, I think. You see, at the mental ego level, who are you is really, I am who other people uh, paint me as, as being. I have no sort of knowledge of my inner self. Uh, But if you tell me I'm a brilliant writer, I'm a brilliant writer. If you tell me I'm shit, I'm shit, you know. uh, uh, um, It's all about self-image rather than the self. At the centaur level, um, I see through my own eyes I'm an authentic person. I'm an existential uh, ego um, I take responsibility for my life and and the meaning of my life and so forth uh, so in other words I would answer at that level I am a real self I am me I am I own my own reality and I could create my, my own reality 
so I am a real self uh, the next level is a subtle level and at that level uh, I am my soul I am a spiritual being uh, I'm in touch with the divine uh, I uh, own up to uh, being on the same level with the uh, the gods, the goddesses, the angels, the devas, the trees, the, the water, the uh, uh, the air, the sun, the, the rain, the sun, and so on. So, so. I am uh, I am my soul. Brent Courtright writes about this: uh, the antaratma. Mm -hmm. I am the antaratma. At the next level, the causal level. Uh, <coughs> There is no separate me uh, or I. Uh, I am one with the universe. I am one with God. I am one with uh, the ultimate. I am one with... Uh, there is only the one. <laughs> and uh, I'm it. Uh, uh, or part of it or whatever way you like to put it. But there's only, there is only the one. And therefore, my answer might be the shunyata, the void nothing uh, that's that's all I am uh, whatever and then at the next level the non-dual level uh, I'm just laughing because there's no answer to this uh, uh, what are you talking about uh, mm. self you know, bullshit you know, forget it you know. um, so uh, it depends what level I'm speaking from mm -hmm. as to what my answer is to that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, have you, in Jungian terms, dumped your shadow? Yes. Yeah. I think so. I think so. I've spent 10 years doing that, uh, working through my uh, uh, all stuff that was uh, holding me back from being. Uh, a real self. I mean, that's that's the shadow work. So you became fully functioning. Yes. Yeah. In 1980, I proclaimed myself to be a fully functioning person uh, and fully self-actualized. But your regular meditation didn't start till 82. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the shadow is not to do with meditation. The shadow is to do with a lower level mm -hmm. that, you know. uh, um, therapy is the way to get from uh, mental ego to centaur mm -hmm. um, uh, ritual and ceremony is the way to get from centaur to subtle right. meditation is the way to get from subtle to causal your use of LSD, and you said that you had uh, tape recordings of your... Yeah, yeah. Did you ever get those transcribed? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've been into this question, and uh, nobody can do it these days, because nobody's got the machine left. Nobody uses those machines anymore, reel-to-reel -reel, right. uh, tapes of that size. Uh, they don't exist. So sh if we put out a um, a request, anyone listening who could transcribe reel to reel, yeah. there's some. I still got them left, yeah. Right, and they're still they still being preserved in good nick. All right, what nick they're in? I don't know about the sort of technical processes that happen to tapes with the passage of time. But they've probably deteriorated. I would imagine. Yeah. When do you think it's okay to provide the kind of challenge where you would ask someone who's really asking that question? Would you be mindful of providing a risk assessment in your mind about whether someone's ego is healthy enough to handle that level of challenge? Yes, I think it's always a question of judgment. The therapist is continually judging the suitability of this statement or that statement or this question or that question or, or whatever. There's a sort of self-monitoring 
process that's going on all the time uh, in the background, so to speak. Uh, uh, because uh, everything you say or every silence is 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 a uh, an action. It's, uh, it changes the situation in some way, to some degree, and so. Uh, Everything the therapist says is uh, uh, chosen, is meaningful, is uh, part of the process. Are you optimistic for the future of the profession? Yes, I think so. I think, uh, uh, like every profession or like every uh, speciality of any kind, it will go through changes. Uh, has to do with time, you know. And sometimes this will be up, and sometimes this will be up, and this will be down, and this will be up, and this will be down, and so forth. And, uh, but I think it's, it's here to stay, so to speak. I don't think it's going to disappear or uh, get lost. Creating an existential crisis, the, the, the proliferation of technology. Well, you know, crisis. Crisis, you know. I mean, uh, um, you can always find a crisis if you're looking for it, uh, you know. Um, and some of them actually do happen, and some of them don't happen, and so forth. But uh, I just think human beings are human beings, and uh, they go through all kinds of mistakes about who they are, and what they are, and what they're about, and so forth. And, as new technology comes along, which it inevitably does, uh, it distracts people in a different direction from what they were distracted by before. Uh, there's no end to distractions uh, mm -hmm. that are possible, you know. And I think we've become uh, better and better at being distracted. Uh, uh, but. Uh, the cycles in these things, you know, and uh, uh, eventually these people think, no, this is just distraction, you know, uh, what about something more real, mm. or, or like deeper, and then they start thinking, oh, well, you know, I've discovered this guy called Aristotle, you know, he's an amazing guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we, we we briefly touched on the existentialist, but where do you see the existential kind of quest for meaning in terms of an integrative psychotherapeutic practice? Well, I think that's uh, it. Always be part of that, uh, or you can't escape from the existentialist challenge which is to say uh, you are responsible for yourself uh, and uh, you have every right to be an authentic being um, um, and uh, there are various ways of putting that various existentialists and phenomenologists of course um, um, take different stands on that from, and we're interested in different aspects of it and so forth. You know, I'm a member of the Society for Existential Analysis and I'm on their list of uh, uh, qualified existential analysts. Right. Uh, um, uh, so, and I've contributed to existentialist uh, conferences and so forth. So, I'm, I'm very interested in existentialism. And at the moment, in fact, I'm I think I think on uh, Kierkegaard uh, uh, saying that um, how come he's got such a reputation when he hardly ever wrote anything about it because essentially uh, yeah. yet in transpersonal I mean although Wilbur rejects sometimes the transpersonal tag but yeah. he's often cited as the academic in transpersonal, but not by academics, though. Not by academics. Why not? Because he uh, didn't get it from academia. He didn't get it from going to college. 
doing tribute from uh, a proper course. Yeah, right. You're listening to an interview with Dr. John Rowan with me, Noel Bell. Looking back over your career, what single theory would you say has been most beneficial in your client work? You know, some people will talk about attachment theory. I would say Fritz Perls, actually. Right. He, uh, possibly because he was one of my first loves in the field of uh, psychotherapy. But I still refer to him, and I still think he was uh, extraordinary, uh, perceptive uh, guy, and uh, very brave, very innovative, very innovative, very unafraid of experiment and uh, challenge, and uh, and uh, you know, I often said that. Uh, existentialists write a lot and think about and talk a lot about existentialism but Pearls actually does it or did it Mm -hmm. he was a prime example I think of uh, purely purely existential therapist and I suppose we should say that there are there is quite unique footage on YouTube even of Pearls yeah Uh some good interviews yeah. I mean, he was just a brilliant showman. Yeah. Among other things. He could actually do it on the hoof. Yeah. And, uh, very, very penetrating work. And, I mean, there's an interesting thing about that, don't know if you've come across, uh, a fact about him that um, uh, he was unable to have uh, visual images. He could not visualize, mm. and uh, he put he called this his impotence, and it came because of the he was an orderly in World War One, and uh, had to carry stretchers oh. uh, on the battlefield and so on, and he was so affected by the horrors that he saw in that role that it, it destroyed all possibility of him having a visual image and therefore because he hadn't got any distractions from his own inner visual images he was fantastically perceptive in the expressions and micro expressions on people's faces and the movements of their bodies and and so forth and uh, so every defect is an advantage and every advantage is a defect could I just ask you, are you aware of the 12 steps mm. of recovery? Where where, oh, yeah. where where would you place that, mod- obviously heavily influenced by Young and the Numinous, but where would you place that in r- relation to a psycho-spiritual development map? I think it's pretty good. That's all I'd say, really. I haven't any personal experience of it, uh, uh, but I've had a lot of clients who, uh, and I've, I've, I've therefore read about it and so I've read the twelve steps and so on. I, I think it's a very positive, very worthwhile uh, set of uh, injunctions, and it wouldn't do any harm to any of us to <laughs> follow the twelve steps. You know. Yeah, and that brought us to the end of the interview. For more psychotherapy interviews and podcasts, please visit noelbell.net forward slash podcasts. For more interviews with Dr. John Roan, visit his website, johnroan.org.uk forward slash videos.